Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Tolan. I'm a mind body coach and teacher. Today, I have quite the recovery story to share with you. Angela Lawrence was a busy, active woman working as a counselor. She's a mother of two. She was very physically active, running and doing other sports. When she went through a very stressful time, she caught COVID. That developed into long COVID. And she had a range of really strong symptoms, POTS, dizziness, fatigue, brain fog, headaches, uh, head pressure. So when Angela reached out to me, I could sense she was determined to recover. She had done some brain retraining, but she was somewhat new to this mind-body approach and she dove in. And I am happy to say, not only has Angela made a physical recovery, but she's really discovered this self-compassion and this, this newfound zest for life, uh, this love of life and, and love of herself. It's it's beautiful. It's infectious in the best kind of way. And I'm really looking forward to sharing Angela Lawrence's story with you today. She joins us from British Columbia. Angela, it's so great to see you. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Rebecca. I'm so honored to be here. This is just exciting. Really you're, you're so inspiring to me. And I know so many others who hear this. Well, let's just start out. How, how are you feeling today before we go back into your whole story? Oh, well, today I, um, well, I was up really late last night. Yay. That doesn't, <laughs> wasn't possible three months ago. Um, uh, yeah, I'm great. I'm feeling great. I had mind body symptoms for years and years and I'm feeling better than I did then. So I'm good. I'm great. I'm great. But not only that, I just have just so much more. My, my life has just expanded beyond anything I could have imagined with this experience. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to share. <laughs> I am so excited to get into that because it's like, you really show us the potential for what seems like maybe the worst thing that's happened to us can become such a gift. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but to see how sick you felt, um, tell us a little bit about COVID and then kind of the progression into long COVID and how that changed your life. Right. So I contracted COVID for the first time, um, like a, January, 2022, and um, it was very mild. My whole family got it. We laughed about it. We took pictures of our, <laughs> we took selfies with our COVID tests. And um, I was, uh, it, I was, um, yeah, I was really optimistic. I'm going to say at that time, it was a really stressful time for me and, and my family and um, um, lots going on within my family. My daughter was having some pretty serious illness and I had just had a lifetime of severe anxiety. So just a super anxious person um, since I was a child. Um, so that's kind of how I went in. When I think back now, I was I was in a very heightened state of, of sympathetic <laughs> overdrive when I got COVID, despite, you know, but you sort of live in it. I was living in that stress. So you didn't you know, I didn't notice it. You're just like a fish swimming in that pond. And that's, that's normal for you. Right. And I actually find that's fairly common that people who develop long COVID as well as CFS and these symptoms, like look back and see a history of anxiety, just not being comfortable in your body in that flight. Right. Fight. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And people pleasing and all of that kind of stuff. We can talk about that as well, but not having a voice. I went years without really voicing um what what my own needs right yes. um which which was implicated in my big crash because I went five months really not listening to my body I mean being confused about what was going on I was just had this lingering fatigue that that was quite manageable so I just kept working kept exercising and I would have the odd day where I just had to sleep a little extra maybe during the day and um I I, I knew it was probably related to COVID but I was not concerned about it. And I just kept marching forward in a intense way. 
Um, and then um, at around, you know, May of last year, I started to have panic attacks. <clears throat> I'd never had panic attacks. I had, um, you know, anxiety attacks, but nothing that was uh, as profoundly, you know, panic attacks and anxiety attacks are, are different. Yeah. And, my, and these were panic attacks. So these were just incredible tachycardia with uh, this overwhelming sense of doom and uh, a sense that I was going to die. That yeah. was that was how bad they were. And I had no idea that that was re even remotely related to the fatigue. Um, you know, my doctor was quite supportive and even said, like, I think this is probably long COVID, but, um, you know, there's just no direction. And when when the psychiatric aspects started to arrive, I didn't see that as remotely connected. So um, and when I say psychiatric, it was like a it was a two month very awful crash that uh, was primarily at that time. When I say psychiatric, I mean, I mean, depersonalization, paranoia, um, like profound anxiety, profound depression. So I felt like I was completely unraveling within, within about three months it, or no, three weeks, actually, it was very close. And I was in, in the hospital a number of times, and um, uh, at, at one point I felt I was kind of wandering around. I'd gone to the hospital and I just left my car mm -hmm. and I parked my car and just started wandering around town, mm -hmm. thinking, honestly, thinking that I had died. Yeah. And I was a ghost. That, <sighs> that was how just profoundly dysregulated my whole sense of self was so so it was a very um you know it was a, what what's what I know now is a psychiatric presentation of long COVID which I had I just had no idea about that um and that was really hard on my family it was hard on me I thought um that I was yeah I was having a, a psychiatric crisis that I was going to have to um be hospitalized for and in fact the last time I went into the emergency room I I asked to be hospitalized because I couldn't um I couldn't guarantee that I could keep myself safe wow. because that's mm -hmm. you know and this is coming from despite my anxiety you know and my kind of intense personality I was a pretty joyful person like that was like not any I had no point of reference for any of that and um, I remember being in the ER once and they had to separate me from the, the people that were waiting Yeah, <laughs> because I couldn't stop crying, like howling, crying. Like I just did not feel like I was remotely myself in any way. And you didn't know what was happening. You had caught COVID. You were, you were tired, but you kept pushing through. Six months before. Yeah. And then, mu and then more stressors piled on yeah. in your family. And, and yeah. there was this like tipping point where you just yeah. had panic attacks. Yeah. And right. didn't, couldn't recognize yourself. And were these, and then were these other long COVID like symptoms coming on at that time too? Like the POTS, yeah. dizziness. Yeah, the POTS fatigue. came on last, so, but the, the dizziness, the depersonalization. And I, you know, I think, I think, I think that's what's referred to as brain fog, but it was it was like this film that would come over my brain and it and suddenly I would feel like I was in a dream and then it would lift and I'd be like oh my god I'm back and it would just it just kept doing this and then it just got more and more intense and and then it just stayed um but it was one of the ER visits that um I was able to see an um an emergency psychiatrist and she was just quite brilliant Mm -hmm. And was very clear that it was long COVID and kind of explained as much as I, uh, even at that point, I was having a hard time understanding language. Yeah. Like I was really thinking that I was done. Like, I'm yeah. like, I have something like profoundly, like I've got a brain tumor or, and, um, and of course, uh, Every time I would go into the ER, I would ask for more tests, right? Because I was just like something so profoundly wrong. And they all came out 
totally normal. So I was, I was given, you know, I had lots of these guardian angels in the ER at that time. They would just, the doctors would just be, okay, we'll give you a CAT scan. Okay, we'll give you an x-ray. Like it was quite amazing. Yeah. But everything came out completely normal. Which, which I know can be both confounding, but also sometimes comforting as well. So yeah, I'm hearing that you were, this was a massive crash physically, emotionally, mentally, in every way you could hardly recognize yourself. How did you start digging out of this? Because as as people are listening to this, right. you are so full of, of clarity and joy and connection that this is a polar opposite from what you're describing. Polar opposite. Um, and it was frightening for my family. It was frightening for my friends. Um, um, and, you know, being, being a mental health clinician, I... I mean, I've supported young people in going through psychiatric crises. <laughs> so I thought I did not know that I would be going through one myself. Like that was, um, you know, I really felt that there was going to be a long road of recovery psychiatrically. But when I found out, so I was, when I found out it was long COVID or it was suspected long COVID and that psychiatrist referred me to the long COVID clinic in which is four hours away from my community in, in Vancouver. Um, I, I had this incredible triage nurse who did my intake and she confirmed everything that I was experiencing as long COVID. And um, that's where I was like all, my whole, like my kids and my husband and I were just able to just go, oh, okay, okay. I'm not, I'm not dying. I'm not, you know, going to be, uh, you know, I don't have schizophrenia. <laughs> like, I, that was a huge relief. And I remember that day, um, my, my husband going, this is great news. Like, this is fantastic. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, okay, <laughs> like, I'm not dying, but I feel like I'm dying. And, yeah. and uh, like, I don't even know, I can't even think like, there's no, like, all of the forms and stuff that came from the long COVID clinic, I couldn't even, I couldn't, I couldn't navigate them in any way. So um, my kids had to help me with those. And, and then within a few days of that, the POTS came, came on, which just put me down. Like I was in bed and I actually um, had, I, I kind of refused to be sick in my bed. So we made a day bed on the front deck and a day bed on the back deck. And that's where I lived until the snow flew. So like four months on these beds, um, which was in the end, it was actually quite beautiful because I got, I got to be still for the first time in my life, like really still. And there, like there would be spiders like normally would go around me, but they started to just go over me. <laughs> Like she's just part of the furniture here. <laughs> oh, but I'm struck by that, that you got to be still for the first time. I mean, on the one hand, I'm hearing that yeah. we see everything you're describing this diagnosed as long COVID as mind body symptoms, because when the brain and nervous system cannot process all the stressors going on, you know, there's this defense mechanism. They just shut down. It's like, okay, no more. And it, it enables you to survive it. Um, And then also it brought on that stillness, which became essential for your realizations, right? And then your opening to mind-body healing. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I had never even heard of mind, never heard of TMS, mind-body. And, you know, and I, I was, I did lots of yoga. I dabbled in meditation and mindfulness and I, I was so I just lived from here up, Rebecca. That was that was it, and at a very high high speed. Yeah. So, um, like I I I've, I joke about this, but in retrospect, it's just bizarre. But I am the type of person that would leave the yoga class during shavasana, so I would just get the hard stuff done, and it would be like I'm out of here. I, this is too you still. Gotta, like get on to the next thing. To to the next <laughs> no thing. time for corpse pose, no and no time that's. Time fascinating because then you were thrust into just laying there like just, all the time and being ha- and being helped to the bathroom and 
um, being like, I couldn't sit up. So, you know, my daughter would joke, Oh, you just have to learn to live your life at a 45 degree angle. And I'm just like, I guess I do. Like I, I literally did. I couldn't read. I had light sensitivities and sound sensitivities. And so literally, um, it was really helpful to actually wear um, headphones, like kind of noise counseling headphones. But when I was outside, um, my brain was quite was happiest. And, um, and when I'm talking about still, I'm talking about still for hours, like hours and hours and hours and hours. Like it, it, I'd never experienced that ever. And, um, and it was the only like just being still and looking around was the most comfortable thing to do. Yeah. And anything else was awful. So it wasn't like, oh, if I get up and walk around, it's okay. No, it was awful. Sitting up was awful. Like, um, yeah, I mean, my blood pressure just dropped. I mean, it does with POTS uh, yeah. symptoms. Um, and, you know, if if I wanted to sort of sit on the grass, I would have to just crawl. I would crawl onto the grass and get a different perspective. And, yeah, that went on for a long time. Yeah, and I had, the, like, the, the thing that was – the thing that lasted the longest, but it was the most debilitating symptom was this intense head pressure that felt like my brains were boiling. So there was pressure, but also heat. And it felt like like hot concrete had been poured into my head. So um, like, it wasn't just headaches, you know, it was this just intense block of heat on my head. Yeah. It is just fascinating to hear you describe this because you were doing five hit classes a week. You're working as a therapist, you're raising two children, and then you couldn't even sit up. You're crawling on the grass. I mean, right. It's a radical shift. So from that place of that quiet and stillness, Mm -hmm. what started turning? Where did your um, recovery really begin? Right. I was so fortunate that within a week of being on the Long COVID Canada Facebook page, which was a very dark place, they were lovely. I mean, I got, I mean, I felt like I needed community. How am I going to get through this? Yeah. And, you know, I, I always considered myself a fairly um, intuitive person. So I would be lying there and I'd be thinking, you know, am I going to recover from this? Like, even though my doctor said, oh, you're going to recover. And even the triage nurse said, oh, yeah, you're going to recover. You know, I was just like, okay, I think I know I'm going to recover. But how, how, how am I going to get out of this? Like, um, and really just totally by good fortune, a lovely woman who's now become a friend um, uh, from Victoria, who's that's not very far from where I live. Um, kind of plucked me from the long COVID Canada <laughs> Facebook page and said, look, this is your autonomic nervous system. Like she m- private messaged me and said, you got to believe me with this. And I want you to join this recovery program out of the UK. And it's all yoga and meditation. And I'm just like, what? Like, okay, okay, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that. And partly because the triage nurse had said, you know, according to your rec, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong. And she said, I want you to know that I know that the symptoms are real, but you just need to know that you're healthy. Like I just, that was like, that kind of stayed in my head, right? You had several really acts of of grace or good fortune. It's actually quite incredible that pretty early on, you were told this is long COVID, right? Because some people might actually be told, we don't know it's wrong or you're having, you're having this psychiatric issue that's yeah. untreatable. So you were told it's long COVID and you were told by someone you believe like a medical professional, you're going to yeah. recover. And then this other woman who, who brought you in to tell you the, the nervous system component, which is amazing. Cause I feel like people go years or decades right. because they don't have the right information. Right. Oh yeah. Right. So this was like a turning point for you. Like, okay. So yeah. a yoga meditation, this can help calm the nervous system. You have right. to believe that it's coming from the brain and nervous system to, to want to do those things. Otherwise it just feels like, Oh, how is that going to help? Right. Right. And I just, I noticed, 
um, the, on the face long the long COVID Canada Facebook page that people were just like really focused on medications. And uh, I mean, I knew enough by that point <laughs> to know that there's really no medications that are. I mean, there might be some medications that might help with the pots or things like that, but. I'm like, I think I'm on my own. Like I really had that sense. And then I'm like, I think I just need to rest. Um, I need to quiet my mind and I need to manage my fear. Like those were, it was very clear from the beginning that it's so hard. This condition, oh, lots of chronic conditions. It's just so hard to be in your body. Yes. And so your body doesn't feel safe. Right. Because what you just summed up are really the keys to healing. And a big part of the reason our mind's so active is because it is so uncomfortable in the body that those thoughts are a defense mechanism, right? They're, they just jump us right out of our body. And so we need like safe ways to be in the body that at least feel okay, if not pleasurable. And so I remember jumping ahead a little bit when we first met, you were really enjoying that, the yoga, the meditation, the understanding that the nervous system is perpetuating these symptoms. And you had also done some brain retraining, which was helpful, but you were, you were saying you, you still were kind of stuck. Yeah, I was a bit, I was a bit stuck. The the brain retraining, I still do it. Uh, I think it's a brilliant tool. I think it's all very so individual. I ended up feeling well, partly Rebecca, because I knew even way before you and I spoke that this experience was going to be so much bigger than the symptoms. I really felt it was a portal into something. And, um, you know, the brain retraining was great at getting me going, getting me out of the house, literally, and managing some fear, managing a lot of fear. Um, But I still was at war with myself. Does that make sense? Yes. I was looking to, to love myself. That's what I was, I didn't know at the time, but I was, because I, you know, I I still had this very debilitating pressure in my head that was like, everything else seemed to have fallen away by that time. And, uh, but this, this, this pressure in my head, uh, I know I, uh, I hated it. Mm. I hated it. Yeah. And I would have these tantrums, like, it's a bit embarrassing to to think back, but I would have these tantrums about it being there. And at some point, I... Uh, it was maybe around Christmas time, I thought, I can't be doing this. Like, I can't. So I need to see this experience as something that's that's protective of me. Like, so I just imagined it as this big furry creature kind of like hugging my head. And I called it my familiar. So I was just like walking around with this like furry thing on my, I mean, it was, but that was kind of the first step. But yeah, I still, befriending it, befriending, befriending it. the sensations and befriending your body. And I love that, just making it so light and funny, like you've got a critter on your head. <laughs> right, but it was like a fake it till you make it experience. I'm just like, I still freaking hate this. I hate yeah. it. And so by the time I got to you, I, you know, I had done a bunch of research on you and watched interviews that you'd done. And, and we just, you know, you kept bringing up, self-compassion and and I'm just like oh oh yeah yeah regardless of whether this furry creature goes away I need to love it because it's (laughs) me right it's me (laughs) and I, I can't keep othering it this is me this is my experience and I also was starting to think oh there might be some emotions behind this because I had avoided that yeah. for a long time I'm like I I remember downloading the curable app and all I all I would do and it actually it actually kind of like alerts you to this but I just kept going for the science the science the science I just want to learn yeah. and then at one point it's like it's awesome that you're learning but maybe you should do some practice <laughs> and I'm like are you kidding me I'm not gonna 
I'm not going to journal. Practice means I'm like going into the dark, scary terrain of emotions. Oh, I, I didn't want it. I didn't want to go there. But by that time you and I were speaking, I thought, oh, I think I might have to go there. So, and then I started your course just right after that. Yeah. So you, you just finished the Bureau there. of Medicine course. I did. Yes. Not long ago. So I want to say too, I see that this is really, it was common with me and it's common with a lot of people that it's like, we need the knowledge first to feel safe and then maybe some brain retraining or other mental strategies. And then there becomes this readiness, like, okay, that next layer of healing is the deeper emotions and and befriending myself. And when you started the course, I, I could just feel you were so ripe for that. So I'm curious what your experience is. And for people who don't know, it's a, it's a 10 week live course with a lot of knowledge, a lot of practices and meditations, and there's a a real sense of community in it. So what was your experience and what were the missing pieces for you? I was carrying a lot that I had never dealt with. And, um, and by this time, uh, I, I'm, I was aware that, okay, I can't, I can't brain train that away. Like this is something that's waiting to be heard and felt. And so uh, starting that program, you know, uh, oh goodness, even the first session, the first live session, because I'd done a lot of listening. I couldn't read books. Yeah, <laughs> I still I get it a little bit hard, um, but I would, I, I, like Dr. Sarno was like, Alan um, Gordon, like I, I did, went down the list. So by the time we had that first session, I, I was just, I was just so ready. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think what you said it in that first session, you have to drop everything. You have to just stop trying to fix yourself. Yeah. And it took a couple of weeks, but I finally got that, like in my bones, that sense of like, oh my gosh, I've just, you know, I'm, I'm getting better and things are moving forward, but I'm trying so hard. I'm just trying so hard. And then I stopped and it was, it was that, um, it was just like, you gave me permission just to drop it all, just to ditch it and I ditch the, tr- ditch the trying to heal the fighting yourself the fixing yeah everything so I I mean I wish I could show you the kind of like schedule that I had <laughs> I actually should I should <gasps> I mean I was had timers and um reminders and I I was scheduled the whole day was scheduled with healing Healing practices, and you were probably in this like hyper vigilant state, just always looking for what do I need to be doing? You're not, you said you're not broken. You're you're okay, and you can stop trying to. And and I realized, despite all of those wonderful practices, some of them I still do. Um, I was just telling my nervous system how broken it was. You know, yes. it was. I, that was such a revelation and it was, it was really hard. Uh, I had a couple of days of solid tears and that's how I know it was so real because I, I, I couldn't go back. Right. I couldn't kind of scramble back and keep, because I knew I had to stop everything. And so I did, like I literally stopped doing any kind of feeling. That is amazing, the power in that, Angela. And especially as someone who's clearly type A and had this lifelong strategy of achieving and doing more that you were able to embrace the one thing that none of us think of, right, is just to let go of the fixing and just be and be and see what your body really needs. Well, for someone who's chronically anxious, um, letting go is, is kind of like dying. <laughs> you know? yeah. You're giving up control. And I had never, ever done that with anything in my life. I'd never surrendered, maybe, maybe giving birth. 
that was about as close as I come I had come to surrendering yeah. to things. And and um that level of surrender, like I really felt like if I don't get any better than I am today, I'm gonna live a good life. Mm. That was I was absolutely clear about that that I had to accept every everything that was happening and uh which included surrendering to uh like give, letting go of fear of a whole bunch of things in my life actually it all kind of happened <laughs> within a couple of days um when I addressed some pretty major issues in my marriage as well in a in a totally fearless manner I I I still find it hard to believe like that was it feels like that was like a there was me before that moment of surrender and then there's me after the moment of surrender and uh they're different people do you feel that it was like an act of grace that happened because Mm -hmm. I say the same words to a lot of people right take Mm -hmm. I invite you to take a vacation from fixing yourself and this is a key to healing Mm -hmm. Um, but what was it in you that was able to hear the truth of that which you needed, which was letting go and surrendering? Was it kind of like a passive act of grace that happened? Was it a conscious decision? No, it was passive. Mm-hmm. That it was it was a lightning bolt. Yeah, because I've always tried to fix myself. Yeah, because I've n- I've never loved myself. Mm-hmm. Right. So so fixing this was just another thing to fix yeah. you know and if I didn't fix myself I would fix other people and that's why I got into the I'm sure that's why I got into the field that I in. yeah. and so it was just a radical act of of uh surrendering to what is and I I totally get it I totally get what Buddhists mean by that surrendering to what is I get it now and what happened? What was that that place like, which I understand you're still experiencing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it was hard. It was, um, I didn't, I, I felt groundless. Yeah. Um, and then I was, I, I happened to be listening to um, one of Pema Chodron's books at the time. And it was When Things Fall Apart. <laughs> I love that book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And she talked about the groundlessness is the only real place to be. It was just a perfect, perfectly timed moment. Yes. And, uh, and I got profoundly calm, mm. calm, just perfectly calm and, and okay with whatever outcome was there for me. And I also realized I had a wonderful I, one of my great supporters has been my mother-in-law who's just turned 80 and she's just this incredible mm, like elderly hippie woman who's lived a, such a full life and I remember her saying at some point in the last year she's like you know Angela when I was growing up people were ill a lot people don't know how to be sick anymore yeah. we just people don't get sick so much and we don't know how to be ill and and I thought to myself, you know, I've had 55 years on this planet as a super healthy person. If I have to spend the latter half of my life being a not a super well person, I'm that, that's okay. That's just life. I could never have said that before my surrender. I could never have said it. I was, it was more like, there is no way I'm living like this. There is no way. It's so fascinating that we don't want to say if I have to live like this, so be it, because we think that's going to make it true, right? Where it's like, I'm just hearing and want to like underscore what power there was in you saying, okay, whatever is, is with my health, with my life, with my entire circumstances. Right. And I also said to myself, this is what is now. And it could be. Yes. and it, there's so much, there's just so much more possibility when you're not fighting. So that is really key because I yeah. think what happens a lot of times is when we have these symptoms, people then go to, oh, it's always going to be this way. And that does lock it in place because we close to new ideas and possibilities. Absolutely. So you're just honoring the truth of this moment, 
is right. I feel really sick, right? And I still have these sensations. They're not harmful. Right. And I know you still, though, then had some intense times, even after this shift. So I wonder if you could talk about this, what you describe as an almost biblical experience walking into the pain. Yeah. So that was the next step because I knew I was okay. And I knew I wasn't, my head was not going to explode because honestly, it felt like that at times. And I thought, okay, I, you know, I accept this right now. And I'm going to work with this. Like what is really going on here? I was just became really fascinated and curious and not to say that, I mean, I had lots of moments of tears, like, let me just be clear, but they never lasted. Like they, it would just be like a release, just like, Oh, this is so hard. And then I would just go right into self-compassion. But I decided I had an opportunity. Um, I still can't believe, like, please don't do this at home, anyone. <laughs> like, I had an opportunity to house it at my mother-in-law's place. And she just lives in this hippie, beautiful little old house. And, and she has 90 acres of wilderness around her and a beautiful river. And I, I got the place to myself for a week. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to figure out what is behind this intense head pressure that is so debilitating it doesn't have to go away but I want to understand it and so I moved out to her place and there's really terrible cell reception it was just me and and your recording of the the somatic tracking (laughs) and I had I just woke up when I woke up on the first day and I'm like this is it I'm 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 going to journal I'm going to EFT tap. <laughs> and, but it wasn't like a schedule. It was like, whatever my body needs, I'm going to do it. I'm in a somatic track, but I'm going to start hiking. I'm going to start swimming. I'm going to start running. I'm, I was just like, this is it. I had sort of, you know, I'd sort of crawled into life by that point And I was okay with that pace. And it wasn't like I wanted to push it, but I'm like, okay, every time I do more than like 4,000 steps, this head pressure just gets so intense. Like it was that I, you know, I'd have to just go, you know, lie down and block everything out. But, and it's not that it would ever go away. It would stay. (laughs) It wasn't like I could take a Tylenol or something and it would be fine. So I just decided whatever happens, happens. As long as I know I'm going to be okay no matter what happens. And, oh, my God. (laughs) So bad. Every day I would, you know, but I kept going every day. I would. You kept walking and hiking, like, and doing things that was causing the pain. I wanted it. I was just like, I'm inviting this because I thought there is something under this. So I'm like, bring it on, bring it on. But I would be, I, I sat down and I did some serious journaling and you know did the you know the the, made the three lists and had some very very profound releases of mostly rage like huge like like animal screams coming out of me um which wasn't a surprise I'd been harmed there were many times in my life where I'd been harmed and and felt really um, frozen around it. Yeah. And, um, but it just, it just kept, you know, it, well, then it changed on the third day or so it changed to like migraine level, like mm-hmm. a 12 out of 10 pain. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when it, when that happened, I, I laughed, I just thought, Oh, Oh yeah. Okay. I know what's going on here. <laughs> like, you're not going to get me. This is okay. We're we're okay. We're safe. We're safe. And I just kept doing the work. I would exercise. I would, um, I would do very joyful things. It wasn't just around like, I'm going to be really intense here. I would, I would sort of balance everything with joy. It was just like, I just felt like I was in an altered space and it was just me and my nervous system and nature and spirit or whatever. And it, it did get 
on like a fifth day, I just, I remember kind of like sitting there with my head in my hands. I'm just going, I, oh, Rebecca, this better work. (laughs) 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 Also, the the beautiful Nick just was such an inspiration to me. And I Yeah, Nick Kutsas, we'll we'll link this interview. I love Nick. Oh, this work, man, this better work. And on the sixth day, it's kind of sounding biblical, but on the sixth day, I had just finished a very big cry of grief from a memory. And it just went away. It stopped. It stopped and went from like a 12 pain and pressure to a two. And my head cleared. And like, it was like that. And I feel like John Sarno would be cheering right now. You know, he said it's the repressed rage that is. Oh, how the literal was the, how literal yeah. was the pressure and the heat? Yes. Like and when this memory and this emotional memory was felt and you felt some sort of release with it, the head pain dissipated. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 it felt surreal because, yeah. you know, I'd had this for a long time and it had been ramped up for a week. And uh, I, I walked out into the garden and things were clear and, and everything was just so three dimensional. If anyone's had brain fog and, you know, <laughs> things are not, they're kind of two dimensional and like colors were bright. I, and, and I just, kind of like curled up on the grass and cried and then laughed and then cried and then laughed. And I thought, whatever, if it comes back, I know what's going on now. Like I know what's going on now. You (laughs) knew that was old emotions. You knew the symptoms were these old emotional memories. Yeah. And it, and it did, it came back quite badly for about a day, like maybe a few weeks later. Um, but it lasted a couple of hours, um, you know, and I've been doing somatic tracking every day and I, and I do, I, I feel emotions through that way. It's really actually hard to journal. So I would start like that whole week that I was journaling, I would start the journaling. And as soon as I could kind of feel a flavor of the emotion, I would start some tapping. Like I, that's kind of how it came up. And then it would just like, it would just burst out. Like it was quite ex- astonishing. Um, so I do that. I'm still doing that every day, but it's, you know, it was always hovering between an eight and a 10 with intensity. And now it, it's zero to two at this point. And it, and it just keeps getting better. It just keeps getting better. And for the first time the other morning, I woke up and I was just making some coffee and this voice in my head, it didn't even feel like my voice. It, I guess it was, but said, how are you today? How are you feeling today? And I was like, eh. like, oh my God, that was sort of a spontaneous, natural inquiry. Yeah. I never have done that before. So, From yourself, like a deeper part no, of yourself. No from a deeper part of myself, just like, yeah, how am I today? What am I feeling today? Like, yeah, that was, that was so exciting because I, I, it was like something really deep has shifted here. Yes. And, And then the symptoms are just, they're going, they're just going, they're just, they're going. And, and I have a funny, weird, relationship now to those symptoms because I'm you know I'm kind of missing them <laughs> it's a weird thing to say but um I just began to love them I know that sounds so strange Rebecca but I began to love them and in loving them I started loving me yes right yes so there you go um, that is so profound that you would love the symptoms so completely, you would even miss them. 
Yeah. And not because, and what I'm not even hearing because of what they could do for you. Like, oh, because they gave me this release just because they were present and they were, they part, were part of my experience. Part of my experience. Yeah. And, and they were such uh, like determined messengers. Yeah. Like, like there were some symptoms with the brain training that went away, but there was this particular one that was so intense and that should have, that, sh- that should have like twigged me, right? <laughs> like, this is so intense. Like it was intense because there was so much intensity that I was pushing away. Yeah. 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 Wow. Is it, I, I'm just in awe <laughs> listening yeah. to you. It's like, I can feel this huge transformation that happened. And, and I think it's important to note that there were certain things that you did and that happened that that helped set up the conditions for that right like you were really finding what made you feel safe also going to a place where you knew you could just scream and cry with abandon because no one was around but you you at this point had tools right you had somatic tracking you had realization these sensations are so strong but they can't harm me they're just an expression from my nervous system of right. how safe my brain feels. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And you had, and you had accepted your body and yourself as they are. 100%. 100%. And you know, the tools are so critical, very critical. Um, and uh, like your, your course sort of has them all one stop shop. So I would, you know, we didn't have all of the tools at that point, but we certainly had somatic tracking and we had, I had um, been doing, since you and I had spoken, I'd been doing a lot of Kristen Neff's um, meditations that were free on her website. So I had, so yeah. And then I had the, um, with the journaling and the tapping and, and then the cold water, I was always in the cold water. I would just, you know, sort of, again, that was like surrendering to nature, surrendering to like just letting my body do its thing. So yeah. kind of getting out of my own way. Um, yeah, I know I, I went into that seven days with, with some great tools that are lifelong tools. <laughs> They're life tools. It was profound time. It was profound. It was a, it was a, I'll never forget it ever, ever. No. And I, and I, and I don't think you'll be the same again because you, you gave yourself that gift, right? The gift of that time, the gift of healing. It can feel so much like we need to get on with our life, but what kind of life is that to get on with, right? What you're describing now, and, I, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about this of just we, we did a lot of, you know, self-compassion in the course and working with Kristen Neff's work um, as you were doing as well. And how has all of that helped you just learn to love your life and, and love yourself. And to me, it's sounding like your experience, a a whole different mood state, a whole different reality. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how I wake up, I can hold it. And you can't, I don't think you can do that without being your best friend. And like, like inside of myself, I have a cheerleader. I have, um, a deep love and so profoundly proud of myself for this whole experience and the kind of grit that is required by all of us who have chronic illnesses. Um, I, I am absolutely amazed at the, the person I'm becoming. I would, would never have known that she was in there like this incredibly strong and, uh, fearless like it it's exciting it's exciting to sort of see like ooh, who am I who am I going to be in a year (laughs) so much (laughs) so much that you are actually and just to also to show people how far you come you're you're hiking every day you're doing all kinds of physical activities yes you were up till midnight last night but I'm back at work yeah and you're working yeah, I started a gradual return to work. You started a return to work. So yeah, I mean, this is all showing up in your physical body. And in terms of the joy, you emailed me this story where you just started like dancing on the hiking trail. 
<laughs> and people ran into you and you're just dancing in love with life. In love with life. And he, like, I was just even, ah, oh, God, I sound so, this sounds so lame, but I'm just in love with humans. And I never was before. I was actually, despite being, you know, a very empathic and caring therapist, I, I liked my alone time because, you know, I, I have, there's definitely stuff in my childhood that, uh, you know, sort of where I developed this habit of being alone, which was safer. And, uh, I don't, I feel that. I mean, I don't feel, um, I just feel really loving towards people. And I, I kind of have this feeling that love is kind of all there is. Like that's, that's all there is. That's all that matters. And that is a new experience. <laughs> that's very new. So I know I'm, I'm going off on the deep end here, but um, yeah, I, I can't, I, I, it's hard to wipe the smile off my face. I mean, it does feel a huge relief to be free of these symptoms. I, I'm not going to lie about that, but yeah, there's just been a, such a reset. I don't know if it's even a reset. It's like an uncovering. I feel like I've been excavated, you yeah, know, the real you. It's yeah. like you could hear, like we, we all sort of hear, oh, love is the most important thing. And we can believe that. But what I am sensing is you are living it. You're feeling it. You're embodying yeah. it. And you're included in that circle of love. It's yeah. yourself and everything yeah. else and everyone yeah. else. Yeah, animals, trees, bugs, spiders. <laughs> spiders, right. And they don't crawl over you anymore because you're not just laying there. But it, it really does remind me of what people describe with a near-death experience, that there's this yeah. yep. part of them so clinging yep. onto this little notion of me and yep. certain comforts that surrendered and something so much greater came right. through you. Right. And, you know, and it's still, I'm, I am actually profoundly interested in, in transitions. Um, you know, in my, in my case, it was a chronic illness, but it can be all kinds of things, you know, um, where we're in this kind of liminal state of transition. And when I look back at the last year and a half, it was just this one, this one big transition into something else. And and um, I'm so glad that I was able to see that early on. I was able to sort of capitalize on that experience quite early on. But it really has felt like um, uh, yeah, excavation is is just the best word I can think of. That I was always in there. In yeah, this exactly. It, it's more of you. Yeah. And so I'm curious because you, you know what it's like. I know what it's like to be bed bound, homebound, so foggy. You can't remember your loved one's names. And so for people watching this, right. what do you want them to know? Where, where do they go? I mean, because we can give different healing practices, but I'm hearing a couple of things. One is that you really, you did take the practices from the course and other methodologies that resonated with you and like made it your own, but you were feeling that from the inside out. Yeah. Yeah. And you knew there was a way out. So yeah, people that are just feeling stuck and people that listen to this channel are really into the mind body approach and right. the TMS right. approach generally. Um, but yeah, what would you say to them? Um, so I would say that the most important piece for me, and I, I kind of got a grip on this fairly early, but it was very hard, was to just understand in your bones or just even borrow confidence from someone else that if you, all of your tests come back okay and you're, and you're, that you're okay and that this is just an incredibly complex and an amazing brain that's trying to keep you safe and so when I figured that out 
um, I, I, it was the beginning of not being at war with my body. And I wonder, I do wonder now when I see people who are really kind of struggling, one of the first things I want to say is just, you know, you're in this room, which is your skin with all of these symptoms you, and you have two choices. You can, you can do this or you can do this. And that for me, opening up to everything that was going on, that level of surrender was absolutely pivotal. Yeah. And you don't really need a tool for that. Yeah. Like that, that's a, that's a shift. I mean, I had, I worked at it because I, I had to keep catching my, and this is where the brain training was really helpful. Is catching the, the, the negative perspectives and doing a lot of reframing. Yeah. So that was, that took several months to actually kind of click in. Yeah. I was constantly catching, you know, I'd actually even do this little, I'm like, Oh, I'm going to catch that. Oh, that's, super negative and that's very self-critical like it was a pretty constant catching mm. and so I guess that falls into mindset Rebecca that yes. that mindset is critical I don't I don't think any of the tools would have been that helpful had I not had that mindset yeah Be, because also when you have all those fear-based beliefs and thoughts constantly ruminating around, it's just revving up the nervous system more and it can keep it in that state. So you were working at the level of mind, catching those thoughts that were fear-based, that weren't true, that made you feel worse, moving into your body. And then like, yeah, really listening to what your body wanted and needed it and giving it that permission to express, to rage, to cry, to hike and to run, even with the pain yes. and giving the, the pain permission to exist. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and I had, a, I had a bit of a wobble, a couple of like, I, you know, I've gone back to work. Uh, my daughter's just graduated from high school. She's off to Europe. You know, uh, I've got a very busy 13 year old son who's into like so many. So I am back at life. And I had a couple of days last weekend where I was just like, oh, yeah, you know, kind of brain fog had kind of settled in again. And I just felt maybe a little anxious. And I, I was just, I just smiled through it. Just like, Oh, I know what's going on here. I know. It's, okay. Oh, what do I need to do? Oh, I, I think I'm just going to do two yoga nidras today. You know, yeah. I, I'm just going to just go lie in the sun, you know, Yes, you know, just what you fun. needed. Just, just listen I, to yourself and what you, your body the, needed. I'm in the river. Like, I, you know, and it was like full permission to do whatever my body wanted. And it was done. It was gone. It was gone. And yeah. What a beautiful note to end on, you know, yeah. just tuning into yeah. what that Mary Oliver calls the soft animal, the body and what you I need. Love that quote. I right. And I, and I think we live in this culture where we, it's still sort of like based on machines, this human yeah. animal yeah. is supposed to be a machine and there's something wrong if we have to stop yeah. and swim in a river or meditate or sit in the sun drinking tea. But right. that's how humans have lived for right. millennia. Absolutely. And to have these ebb and flows and these cycles and being in the mind and then coming back to the body and right. being in activity and then taking rest. Oh, my daughter, it's funny you should say that because my daughter said to me recently, she's like, mom, you've kind of become a bit wild. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what do you mean? And she's like, no, you're not really wearing makeup anymore. I'm, no, I still do, but uh, you're just kind of like rolling around in the grass. You're, you're just like, you're just going swimming and you, can, you don't care. Like, she's like, yeah, you're just becoming a bit of an animal. And I'm like, I think that's true. I'm just <laughs> what can be more healing as Mary Oliver says, just let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Yes. Yeah. Angela, thank you so much. You are such yeah. an inspiration. I just want to bottle you up <laughs> and share yeah. you, but I know we are sharing that, that spirit yeah. you tapped into with so many, and we all have access to that. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Oh yeah. It's our gift. It's our, it's our, it's our spirit given gift. We can absolutely, everyone can tap into it. Everyone. So thank you so much for sharing this today. And if you're listening to this, you know, as you can hear, people are not only recovering from long COVID as Angela did, but finding this newfound sense of purpose, authenticity, joy. I hear that so consistently through this deep mind body healing that there's messages and there's gifts in it. And if you want a more structured way to learn this mind-body approach, my Be Your Own Medicine course has lots of knowledge, lots of practices. You can learn more at rebeccatolan.com slash course. And if you want to try one of the free somatic tracking meditations that Angela and I were talking about, you can sign up for one at rebeccatolan.com slash newsletter. And if you like this video, remember to subscribe so you can find out when the next video is released. Thank you so much for watching and remember to keep following whatever feels healing to you because that is your healing path.